I'm Cody Royal, and this is the Where Others Won't podcast. This episode is a panel discussion about people as a competitive advantage and features Claude Silver, Chief Heart Officer at Vayner Media, and Whitney Johnson, best selling author of Build an A Team and Disrupt Yourself. This episode is sponsored by Athletic Greens, who have a special offer for you later in the show. But for now, enjoy the conversation. Whitney Johnson, Claude Silva, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. This is Whitney. Cody, thanks so much for having me. And Whitney, this is Claude. I'm really looking forward to this, guys. Uh, How I begin each show is by explaining to everyone why I paired you guys together. And for you guys, I was actually listening to your podcast, Whitney, uh, Disrupt Yourself, where you had Claude on. And there was um, just this kind of magical vibe that you two had. And, and I wanted to be a part of that. Uh, you know, coaching football like I do, sometimes there's a couple of players that you see and they just hit it off. And, uh, and I think you guys had that. So um, I wanted to get you guys together and recreate some of that magic. And um, uh, be a part of it. So I'm uh, really looking forward to this show. We're going to be uh, talking about how we can make people our competitive ad- advantage. Um, so I'll start with you, Whitney. You're about eight months removed from Build an A-Team, your latest book. Um, and what I found with mine that I'd forgotten when I released Where Others Won't was that the day that you release it, it kind of goes from being yours to being theirs and uh, it takes on a life of its own. So what have you learned in the eight months since the release of your book about, um, you know, how have people taken your ideas and run with them? Yeah, I love that. It's like having a baby, right? You just, you birth something into the world. And from that moment on, it's no longer, it's no longer yours. It's um, like you said, it's, it's the rest of the world. Um, So, so a couple of things that have been really exciting is I remember having an executive coach. She coaches a lot of CEOs. She said, you know, she read build an A team and, looked at the S curve of learning and had her explained it to one of the CEOs that she coaches. And he said, after reading it or listening to her, Oh, this is why I've been so cranky because he realized that he was at the top of a learning curve and it was time for him to do something new. So that's been one exciting thing that happened. Another exciting thing, I'll give you two more examples is there was um, a, a CTO of a company and he had a person on his team or still has a person on his team. He's really talented. He's been really concerned. Okay, what are we going to do? I can tell he's kind of getting bored. He might leave. And so he explained the S curve of learning to him. And he said, Oh, okay. All right. So it's time for me to jump to a new curve. And so they figured out what he, you know, what he could do something different, go take the company in a completely different direction. And afterwards he said to him, I think you just S curved me. (laughs) So now it's like this slight verb. And then the third thing I would say is to have companies come in and say, okay, this helps me understand. This gives me, you know, I know my organization needs this culture in order to grow. We've got to have It's like this vine we need something to attach to. And so I'm having organizations come to me and say, okay, help us do this. Help us understand this as curve of learning so that every person will take responsibility for their own learning, but also help us embed this in our culture so that we can have people um, have this language and this framework to operate in. And so, so to see this this meme, if you will, start to really um, get into people's minds and hearts is really, really powerful. So, oh, and one other thing, and then I will stop, I promise. <laughs> um, just the other day, Alan Mulally, you know, one of the most important and impressive CEOs of our time, he turned around Ford, he, he was the CEO of Boeing Commercial Airplanes, and he said, this S curve of learning is brilliant. And I was like, my work is done. So that Wonderful. is, that's just a few, but super exciting. Well, and I can vouch for that too. Uh, it is an addictive read. And, and once you kind of, it's such a simple concept, you know, an S-curve, you can already, just by hearing the words, imagine what you're talking about. And so uh, I'm not surprised that it's taken on um, that verbiage and become uh, commonplace. Um, and that's awesome. Uh one thing that I just want to say to Claude, you're a new mum. Congratulations. Whitney mentioned being a mum. Uh, so we will congratulate you on that. Thank you so much. 
<laughs> one of the things that uh, uh, one of the the sub chapters in in his book is called humans as resources and i love that because i talked about that in my book as well and and this concept of words mattering and i kind of posed that um managers should be called coaches and it should be part of their title so that coaching is is inherent upon them and you get a lot of press for your title at at vayner media claude you're the chief heart officer um so i want to know what What's the statement that you're trying to make with that title and why was it an important distinction for you to have that in your title? Yeah, it's a great question. I just want to, I actually want to add to what you said in terms of managers being coaches. I actually believe that if we, if we do this revolution right and bring humanity back into the workplace, that the, the world of HR becomes that of coaches. So that's a that's a kind of a, an aspiration of mine in, in even doing this work. To answer the question, and it's it's might sound very cliche in terms of the the branding of what I do. It's it's twofold. One, we created the chief heart officer role because we we see everyone here as a human being, and every human being has a heartbeat. Um, so for us, for Gary and I, heart really equals HR. And so that's where the first part of the, the, the word heart came from. The other one was that it was very clear when he and I met that I was heart focused, heart led, heart based. Mm -hmm. And so because this is the first of the role here at VaynerMedia and I, and I believe everywhere, um, we've modeled this role after my personality and, uh, and, and that, and that seems to fit, you know, but um, I mean, the heart, the heartbeat is the operating system of each and every human being. And so, again, when I when I talk about bringing more love, bringing more uh, humanity back into corporate culture, I am talking about heart. I'm very, very clear on that. I'm talking about the traits of heart and that those encompass uh, in my world much more EQ than IQ. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and, and I think that's the key part of it is that it can't be a, a vanity title. Um, it actually has to have some behaviors like you talked about underneath it that uh, subscribe to that, that element of heart, like you said. Whitney, um, the narrative at the moment around culture is kind of that you need to have this sexy brand and awesome perks. And, um, you know, we, we kind of look to, to Silicon Valley and tech companies and, and companies are doing cool things. Uh, but you started your book with uh, the story of WD-40 and Gary Ridge, who we've had on the show as well. And they sell oil in a can and, and they have this amazing corporate culture um, and 93% uh, employee engagement uh, and they don't have the sexy brand. So like, what would you say to the bosses of those kind of less sexy brands about how they can reinvent themselves and their people strategy to, to gain a competitive advantage like Gary has at WD-40. Yeah, isn't it powerful? It, it's so interesting to me because exactly people think, okay, it's got to be really exciting in order for people to want to work there. And, and, and oftentimes when I'm speaking to, um, speaking to people, I'll say, you know, imagine that you just gotten a call from a headhunter, you know, it's from a job, it's for a job with a company that makes a product that was invented 60 years ago. And, you know, do you want to work there? And everybody's like, no, nah, not really. And then you say, well, their engagement scores are over 90% and their market cap has gone from $250 million to $2 billion in 20 years, significantly outperforming the S&P 500. And everybody's like, yeah, I want to work there. And it's just so fascinating to be able to then say that this is a company that makes a can of oil. Like they invented their product 60 years ago before most of you were born. And so um, what they have tapped into and they really understand is that um, it's about the individual and that every single person is on a learning curve, including you, including the CEO, and that the thing that motivates people um, beyond, beyond praise, I would say, and even um, beyond certainly beyond money is this opportunity to learn and they've really been able to as we researched the company interviewed Gary Ridge discovered that three of their senior people started as a as a receptionist one now is the company brand manager and so if you want to be a company where people want to work regardless of the product that you make if you will allow your people to learn leap and repeat to have this experience of repeated personal disruption then you're going to have a place people have a place where people want to work regardless of the product that you're selling. And so that would be my advice is give people an opportunity to learn. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and you have to be very deliberate about that stuff as well. And I, I think that's what strikes me in, uh, I first read about it in, in your book and then I started to look into it. Gary's obviously an Australian, so um, uh, got in touch and, and we had a really good chat about that, about how deliberate it is that, um, that they've set themselves on this path. Um, and then Claude, the opposite for you, really, you work for a, a super sexy brand in terms of, you know, the magnetism that comes with Gary Vaynerchuk and um, uh, especially the, the media that he puts out. And he's kind of in the middle of a lot of these conversations and, and people gravitate towards him. So how do you keep your people thriving so that uh, you can deliver on, I guess, what must be heightened expectations for your clients because of uh, how Gary shows up in the world? Yeah, you know, I'm going to echo what Whitney just said and concentrated on, which is learning and development and mm -hmm. wash, rinse, repeat. It is an enormous part of what we do here. And this population, 85% millennial, which is an incredible population, an incredible cohort of, of firepower and brains and brilliance and heart, they're looking for growth and development. They're looking for purpose. They're looking for things that are beyond a paycheck. Uh, they're looking for mindfulness and energy management, energy training. And they're really looking for a sense of belonging uh, fundamentally. So that encompasses diversity and inclusivity. And, and it, inclus uh, it also in encompasses looking beyond just the brushstroke of DNI into othering and how we all feel other, and how can we at VaynerMedia and within our culture, and then extend that to our consumer and our client, how can we be more aware, more self-aware, and more mindful of everything from unconscious bias to social justice issues? And we have a responsibility here, I have a responsibility here, to ensure that we are giving our employees, our human beings, these essential needs I, I, and these essential skills the essential traits and I, I oftentimes will say that while we teach hard skills here i believe that we are teaching life skills i really really do um one of the things that is really important to the population are, are side hustles and uh, as we mm -hmm. are now calling that the gig economy so if we can look at a human being as a whole person and we, uh, and that's what we do here. If we can take into account that they have lives outside of here, that they might have an aunt that's sick or a dog that's in the hospital or just got engaged this past weekend or are stumbling because they have no idea how to have a hard conversation with their manager. If we have as, uh, enough contact with each and every person, which is my job, if we are as high touch as that, then we can give them what they want before they even know they need it. And in turn, I really believe that that creates a, a very, very powerful, um, a powerful person and a powerful connection outside of these walls. As you said, you know, there's, a, I, I do want to just say there's a difference between Gary V, the brand, and that is a very sexy brand, and Gary Vaynerchuk, the CEO, a big, big difference. Obviously, one feeds the other. So I, I never want to uh, to say that it doesn't, but we all work for Gary Vaynerchuk. And that is a little bit different because he is a person that is going to spend time with each and every individual. And that's pretty rare. I mean, so I think that as sexy as it, as it seems, and yes, he's released four or five K Swiss tennis shoes and so forth and so on. We are pretty much what you see is what you get and, and fairly uh, authentic here with no not a lot of masks. Um, we, we aren't the brand of Gary V, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And good to hear that as well. Uh, you mentioned millennials. I want to throw this open because I think um, uh, this is something that we need to talk about more. For me, on my side, I, I came from recruitment. So studied HR in Australia. I was in recruitment for 10 years in Australia and Canada. And so I've kind of lived it for a decade. And, and my perspective on it is that we need to fix the recruitment model that we're using, which is going to fix a lot of the, those problems down the line. Like you said there, Claude, uh, how do we become high touch? Well, it starts right from that, that opening gambit in, in recruitment, how we're showing up in job descriptions, interviews, et cetera, et cetera. It really starts there and it kind of cascades down 
Um, and I think when you when you start to trace back a lot of the issues in the workplace that we're we're dealing with, and this millennial generation in inverted commas is is one of them, um, it starts with recruitment. So how how do we get to the point where we are having those conversations? you know, in the interview so that we can learn how to coach people once they're on the job? Like, do you have any any tips or secrets, Claude, or how do you go about it? Yeah. So one of the things I changed immediately when I, I came into the um, CHO role was the way we even went about talking about hiring. So just the, the phraseology. We used to hire for culture fit. I mean, the company was started by brothers who hired their friends and friends of friends and friends of friends. So the great thing was everything, everyone was alike. And so there was a shorthand. And so speed was, uh, we, we, we aced speed, which was great. But what ended up happening when you lifted your head is that people were all the same. It was a, it was a melting pot of, um, of similar, similar, similar. Mm -hmm. So I immediately changed that from culture fit to skill set fit and culture addition. And right then and there, just changing that phrase and getting that uh, into the water here allowed us to look at the way we were hiring. And so, yes, the obvious part of, of, um, of culture addition is it allows us to look for diversity and diversity in the, the way that we all talk about it, race, ethnicity, sexuality, but also seen and unseen handicap. Also, uh, diversity of thought, curiosity values that are potentially in our zip code, but not exemplified in the same exact way. So that's been a huge score for us. So I'm no longer hiring you because you and I both love Dave Matthews and we both love jam band. That's right. awesome. But it's cool if you, if you like rock and roll, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so that's uh, that's the first part. And, and that, that has been a, a big switch then doing a lot of interview training. And that, uh, that of course, takes into account unconscious bias. And what we do, calling each other out, at least creating the atmosphere where we can call each other out, call, call, and I mean hiring managers when I say call each other out, on um, a mock interview, looking at, uh, I'm sorry, looking at uh, CVs and seeing what we see, like is, are our eyes immediately going to where someone went to school? And I should say, by the way, I removed the uh, requirement of an uh, undergrad degree from every single job description because, I mean, Wait, you just did? That world. You did? Yeah. You did, yeah. Claude? So, like, people yeah. don't have to have an undergrad degree in order to work there. that right. Yep. Wonderful. Not mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. I, I just stripped that away because right there, okay, well, that's just eliminating a population. And in elimin eliminating that population, we are going to eliminate some great thinking and creativity. Absolutely. I posed the, the, the vulnerable job interview, uh, the vulnerable job interview and the, the vulnerable job ad in my book. So, um, I positioned it as the, the Cleveland Browns. Um, you know, one of the things with, with sport and why it's great and why I love comparing sport and business is because it plays out in the public domain. So you get to see it, right? So you see the stats, you see the wins and the losses. But if you're the Cleveland Browns and you're looking for a new player, you don't get to bullshit them like we do in the corporate world and say, we're growing, we've got this great culture. You can see it. They've gone 0-16. Um, so, it, you know, when they're looking for a new quarterback, they have to go with cap in hand and some vulnerability to the quarterbacks that are available to them and say, yeah, look, the results aren't there, but, um, you know, we need some help. Um, and if you start to snowball that idea into how we do corporate job descriptions, even, you know, everyone needs help. And I think you'll, you'll start to kind of radiate at a level where people who want to help you solve the challenges that you have in your business, whether that's client based, whether it's whatever manufacturing, um, you know, putting it out there, you'll get vulnerability in response. Do you guys think that would be a fair statement? That's fascinating. So you're saying, saying um, on a job description, hey, this is where our company is. We're doing this well. This we're not doing so well. We'd like to have some help. Correct. That's a fascinating approach. And I think from a competitive standpoint, there would be some concern. But, the, but I think the reality is what you're pointing out is that your competitors already know where your weaknesses are. And so um, what's fascinating is you think about jobs to be done then you're allowing the jobs to be done theory. You're allowing people to show up and say, oh, so now that I know exactly what job you're trying to get done, then I can maybe help you. 
And then going back to what you just said, Claude, is I don't care if you have a college degree. I just care that you have the skills to solve this problem and the culture addition. That's fascinating. That would just break mm-hmm. them wide open. Totally. Totally. It, as a matter of fact, Cody, I'm looking at a, um, a job description I wrote for someone on my team. And while I am not the best creative writer at all, even the things that I said in the first couple sentences, I think stand out from the average VP of HR job description. Do you have a passion for people in policy? Do you know how to build a world a world class HR practice? Do you like to lead a team to great heights? Are you a player coach? Are you okay with change in a fast paced world? No, really, a fast paced world. Then I go in <laughs> to talk about the the player coach and you know. Um, so again, and that's not to toot my horn on on writing. That's, that's I'm going to put that in witness camp. But um, but I I want to. I want to encourage people to apply to this position that are not tried and true HR practitioners. I would like to color outside the box as much as I can. And I'd like people to be attracted to this job description who aren't looking for someone or a company that is going to be strict with uh, policing and compliance and so forth and so on. While that is important, we have people that do that. We have a general counsel. So I also think that people that are coming to VaynerMedia are either coming because they know that we are onto something, we are in motion, and this is a great place to be, and it's extremely fast paced. They're coming here, obviously, for Gary at some point, or they're mm-hmm. coming here because we now are agency of record for some really, really hot clients, such as Budweiser or Chase or Diageo brands. And if you want to work on your book, if you're a creative or you're a production or a videographer or whatnot, that's cool. You know that Budweiser does some kick-ass stuff. So, so uh, you know what? I, I just want to go back to a few things you said um, earlier in the conversation, Claude, and then I want to ask Cody some questions since you said we could. Um, but there's some things that you said that were so powerful, and I, I just want to call them out. You said, um, the heartbeat is the operating system of every human being. Wow. That is so, that's so, I want to use the word poignant. I think that is the right, I, I know we don't usually use poignant in that, in that way, but I think it's really poignant. And then I love, I never thought of this before, how heart has HR in it and how you mm-hmm. said that the world of HR needs to become coaches. You probably said this a million times, but Cody, wasn't that powerful when she said it like that? Absolutely. And again, I've been in HR for a decade and I hadn't thought about it like that. So I completely agree with you there. That was uh, off the wall. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, so, so, so say it some Thank more, you. Claude. <laughs> yeah, I will. You know, <laughs> Whitney knows me and, and, you know, Whitney and I had a great conversation, great chemistry and, and a lot of vulnerability on the podcast. Um, and Whitney pushed me too, which I really appreciate. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've become more comfortable with lately is the fact that I, I probably think very simply when it comes to this world of HR, and that's not to uh, demean anyone who is a practitioner here because, gosh, that, that, it's a tough, tough role. But because I haven't been in it long and because I've only been in the world of people and, and as a human being for, you know, 40 odd years, my thoughts on it are very, they're, they're very simple. Um, that, that's, that's, a, that's the only way I can, I can really talk about it. So it makes sense to me that human resources, ha- humans have hearts. Let's call this chief heart officer. I'm looking after 800 beating hearts. That, that is, that, that's the equation. There was no trigonometry in there. That was literally just straight up, not even algebra. That's just arithmetic because that's kind of as, as basic as I, as I seem to think about it. Hmm. Very disruptive playing where no one else is playing. So, okay. So let's, Thank I you. think, I think Claude, we should start asking Cody some questions. So Cody, how this. did you, how did you get so interested in this topic? I know you said you did HR, but you, and, and your listeners probably know this, but you were um, a football coach. Like give us, a, tell us a little bit of your story. 
Yeah, well, I became interested in this because of those two things. So you, you, on one hand, you know, Monday to Friday, nine to five, I'd walk in and, and build teams in the workplace. And then I'd walk out of there and go and build this high performing sports team. And so I was literally just living it day in, day out. And the the differences, the similarities, uh, I was paying attention to all of those different things. And um you know, I'm, I'm a, a sports obsessive, so I can talk to you about NASCAR as, as well as I can talk to you about cricket, as well as I can talk to you about the NFL. And so I, I just consume all of that content. And, um, yeah, so I ended up writing the book as I was leaving the corporate world and going into some more entrepreneurial things. And really it was just a collection of thoughts about how sports does the same things that, um, that we do in the business world. And there's, a few things that they do in, in pro sports that they've been doing a, a hell of a lot better for a hell uh, of a long time. And, uh, and we can just grab onto really quickly and, and adapt them. Hmm. Yeah. So what were I you love, coaching? I love that. What were you? Co- yeah. What were you coaching though? Tell us what you were coaching. Aussie rules football. Okay. Aussie rules football. Okay. Got so it. I, <laughs> I, I coach the, the Canadian national team for Aussie rules football. So we've got, Okay. Um, we've got leagues all across Canada. And uh, so I'm, mm-hmm. I put together a, a bunch of Canadians and then we go to a world tournament in Australia called the International Cup. It happens every three years. There's about 25 countries that go and compete. So it's, uh, it's very cool to be able to be involved in my native sport, even though I'm mm-hmm. from Melbourne uh, and now I live in Toronto, uh, to still be involved in the sport that I grew up with is, is pretty cool. Yeah, really Absolutely. cool. I, I, I have a question. I'm going to, I'm going to jump in here for a second. And I, I don't know if like, do we consider NASCAR or formula one a sport? We, we can. Okay. Let's do it. Uh, the sake <laughs> of the question. <laughs> um, you're the expert. So I am absolutely mesmerized with a pit crew. Absolutely mesmerized. And in fact, I want to follow them around. What are your thoughts on, on, the the makeup of a pit crew. I mean, they are they are the essential. That they make or break a driver, correct? For the most part. What? Why? Like, well, how do they get that synergy? I mean, I know it's a team, and yes, I understand football teams and baseball teams to an extent. But like, what is the magic of a pit crew? I wish I had an answer for you on that. I I am I I'm exactly the same as you. I would be fascinated and. I was trying to get someone from Formula One on this show to ask those very questions because, um, you know, they're talking about, I read somewhere, there was an anecdote, I think it was in a book, it was actually about constraints, but um, they went from um, a pit, an average pit stop being four seconds down to three seconds or something like that. And that just changed a driver's career and a team's career, essentially. Uh, hmm. But how they do that, gosh how you're so hyper-focused on that one thing for three seconds and uh, you can just do it a hundred times over without any faults. Mm-hmm. I wish I could do that. So I don't have a que- an answer to that question, but uh, geez, I'd love to know. The three of us need to literally go shadow. We just, I, we need to, uh, we need to go to a Formula One race in Dubai next year and, and shadow. Oh, them, let's think. do it. Let's do let's it. Let's do it. Let's I think that's going to be our okay. gear for this call. We have to make this game happen. on. Game okay. On. Okay. All right. All right. All right. That's our, our dare. I'm yeah. in a thousand percent. Uh, the season just finished. I know that. So we'll be able to get in touch with some teams, but let's make that happen. Love it. All right. I love it. Okay. I'm writing it down. Well done. We have, we have been officially dared, Claude. I am on. I'm so into it. Thank you. And I couldn't think of two other, two better partners to, uh, to travel the road with us, with me, no pun intended. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. Hey guys, I want to ask you about a, a blog that I wrote today, which was about, um, essentially calling bullshit on this idea of measuring a culture during the good times. Um, so, you know, you think about all these iconic corporate cultures that we've built, whether they're Silicon Valley, New York City, wherever it may be. Um, But for me, and this again comes out of 
kind of the sporting realm is where I want to measure it is when things go wrong. So where I'm interested in Google is right now, when you've got 10,000 of your employees out on the street. Um, my interest is in how they respond and whether that, that culture stacks up when things aren't going so well. Uh, I'd love your thoughts on that idea. So the stress test of the culture, how people behave when they're under stress. Absolutely. And, you know, w there's some examples now that are, are serious stress. It's not just the stress of the nine to five. It's, you know, uh, questioning the, the whole culture of the whole business, especially in an age where I guess, you know, talking about vulnerability, like we, we were before and open and honest and all these words that we've plastered up on the wall. What's interesting is whether they stack up in, in circumstances where there's extreme duress. Right. And we don't know. Um, it, it's so, I was thinking a little, uh, uh, kind of about this topic the other day of, and it's tangential, but I think it does relate back. So, you know, I think about my own self and how I'm continually trying to improve of, you know, I have my routines every day and I'm tracking my performance and what worked and what didn't and trying to, you know, do things like be a better coach. And when I'm talking to people, ask things like what else? you know, based on Michael Bungay Sanyar's work, who's also in Toronto. And then I, then I come home and we have two children. We have a son who's 22 and a daughter who's 18. And she'll tell me something and I, the advice monster comes out immediately. And I realize that, that it, it, that's, that's the measure of my training. Like in that moment with the person that I'm most comfortable with, then I know actually how much I've improved. Because if the advice monster comes out with my daughter, then I probably still haven't improved to the degree that I aspire to, even though I might do a terrific job with the CEO that I'm coaching. And so I do agree with you. I think it's similar um, where, um, you know, it kind of also goes to that idea of I don't care. I, I don't want to watch how the person is treating the CEO of the company. I want to know how they treat the person who can't help them at all, ever that is a measure of an individual. And so um, when you see these companies under stress, when you see things not going well, how they behave. In fact, I'm gonna give you one other thought. There's this terrific, terrific essay written by Eric Schoenberg. He's the publisher at Inc. Magazine and Fast Company. He just wrote it in his book called Work is Love Made Visible. And um, have, you, have you seen the book? I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I've heard a lot of things about it. Okay, so here's what's fascinating. He writes this essay and he tells the story of George Washington. And here you have George Washington. It's um, obviously during the Revolutionary War. They have just been routed in New Jersey, just up the road from where you are, Claude, um, you know, Fort Lee, New Jersey. They've been routed. His people are losing faith in him. And um, he's under, you know, tremendous, tremendous stress. And yet he does not let the despair set in. He does not let his people see the despair. And even after he has been at some level abandoned by those around him, um, when they go back and he starts to rebound, he still reaches out to his lieutenants and asks them for advice rather than closing ranks and not asking for any more advice. And so that mm -hmm. to me is really you know, behold a great leader. And so I, I agree with you completely. What's happening right now with some of these organizations and companies is a great, great measure of who they really are and of their culture. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, and, and something you said, Whitney, which was, you know, a, a, let's measure a culture during the bad times or during the sour times or the more anxious times than in the, you know, back slapping hoo-ha times, because, it's great then, and we know that. Well, one of the things that I thought about is, and something we talk about a lot, Gary and I talk about it a lot, I talk about it with my team, I talk about it with the senior leaders, is to be very, very mindful if you ever see someone crying in the bathroom to ask what's up. And I'm mm. using that metaphorically, uh, unless there is someone crying in the bathroom. But there's a lot of anxiety going on outside of this, uh, in the ma macrocosm, obviously in a microcosm, uh, competition within workplaces, uh, people certainly wanting promotions and so forth and so on, salary increases. What do we do when we see someone having a bad day? What do we do when we see someone in the elevator bank crying? 
that's mm-hmm. that to me is how that's where the rubber hits the road and it's not an hr problem by the way it's an everyone problem and an everyone solution it's not just well claude go talk to them because i saw them crying in the elevator bank i'd like to know what's going on because we can offer help we can provide assistance whether or not it's a you know serious something serious outside of work or uh, an issue with the manager inside of work or whatever but that is the that's the real deal and i think gosh when we when a culture i mean that that word culture if we go back in time to one of its roots it was cultura which is the cultivation of the soul and so mm. we go we talk about the human heart we talk about the heart we talk about human beings here well we are whole people i, I am determined to create a place here where f- people feel like they are psychologically and physically safe and i will do that for the rest of my life wherever i go wherever i am that that is critical for a person feeling like they can come and bring their best self whether or not we want to say whole self best self i just want them to come and bring their real self here and that requires all of us to have our hands on the wheel claude do you have an example where that's happened i mean i know you can't give details but can you think of an example recently where that did happen in your organization and how that felt and what it looks like yeah i mean i have the elevator bank uh scenario which i just talked about which was um yeah Uh, and and it's it's life on life's terms here so a lot of things are happening we've had a lot of deaths in the last two weeks things like that or we've had people that are, are going sitting shiva and things like that um so believe it or not, it was a, uh, someone on Gary's team called me and said, there's someone in the elevator banks crying. Now, that person, 23 years old, didn't feel comfortable to go up to that person and say, hey, what's up? And, and that's okay. We'll work through that. We'll work on that. But they had enough wherewithal to give me a buzz. And I thought that was really brilliant. Rather than passing someone by, as we do sometimes and, and certainly you know, with Pat, with, with unconscious bias comes in and, oh, well, that person's just having a bad day or whatever. But I thought that that was really uh, remarkable of this human being to, to care. And that showed me that we're doing something right here. And that's just one example. Um, now, I didn't go scurry to find out what was going on because that would, could be a little bit, uh, a little too much firepower or a little intimidating. But I had someone on their team reach out and it turned out it was a boyfriend situation and that's okay cool but we you know we did put hands on deck to figure that to figure out what was going on with that one human being and um i'm grateful that i I, that i work in a place that that cares i want to come work for you claude (laughs) (laughs) i want to come work for you so we'll make it happen (laughs) sounds great that's that's day number two. Whitney and yeah. I are going to come and work for you, um, <laughs> okay. and we're going to go to the Formula One. <laughs> and uh, you're going to teach us all about Australian football. Yeah. Yes. Well, we'll have okay. plenty of time on the plane um, yeah. <laughs> over to where where were we going to buy? Um, so I'll teach sure. you all about it. Uh, we actually the best way to learn about it is actually at a game. You can't really tell what's going on on the television. Um, so there's a little tip for you. So. The third dare then is we have to go to Melbourne and I'll take you guys to an Aussie Rules football game. You'll love it. Uh, 100,000 people. 100,000 people packed into the stadium. It's it's great. I actually think Uh, we can go see a Formula One race in Australia. So we could just double down and lengthen our trip. We could. We could. Well, it's in Melbourne. It's in March, though, I think, the Formula One. Uh, Aussie Rules wouldn't start until maybe April, May. So it'll be a long trip. Okay. All right. Um, but I, I, I want to go back to, well, firstly, I love what you said there again, Claude, that, that's an everyone problem. I love that idea. And it reminds me of a passage of, of an interview that I wrote about, um, in the book, it was around captaincy actually and captaincy in sport and, uh, a buddy of mine, Stephen Caldwell, um, who has coached, uh, sorry, captained a bunch of soccer teams into the premier league. Uh, he calls them like connection moments and the need to have a connection with everyone on your team because you can't just turn on teamwork. And I loved that idea um, when he said that you can't just turn it on. Whereas, you know, I think a, a lot of the time in, a, in 
particularly in business, we, we, we're in teams, we sit together, but we don't really cultivate those connection moments and the opportunities for us um, to really develop the team um, so that when we do need the teamwork to switch on, um, we know how to. Um, yeah, so that's what I was kind of vibing on as you were talking there. Well, I'm just listening to you talk. I'm like, but which comes first, right? Is it, does the team, you know, you, you have a moment where you work together on a project and it, it works. And so then you feel connected or do you find a way to feel connected and then you're able to work together on a team? So I, so I'll give you an example. So one of my um, business partners, we work really, really, her, her name is Amy Humble. We work really, really well on these projects. We did these three amazing projects last week. It went well, success, happy. Well, on Monday, she had a baby. And I remember when she sent me the picture of her with that sweet, sweet little newborn. And I felt myself like tear up a little bit. I just felt this connection to her and this happiness and this sense of like she's she's one of me or I'm one of, like we're friends like I care about her and the fact that she's had this newborn baby but I wonder like which came first would it have happened if we hadn't been in the trenches together and now we have that moment so I don't know what you two think I mean I think um so I, th I think everything stems from connection and having that connection with someone which which I which builds trust and, and care and compassion and, you know, good oxytocin feelings. So I think it starts there, which I believe can lead to things such as accountability and resilience and, and grit. But I do think that there has to be that connection and trust built somewhere. And and I, I don't mean like a fly by night project. This is like project that would ha would have some kind of longevity to it. Um, but just uh, simplistic simplistically, I, I I feel like you know we're wired to connect. We're wired to to be in community with one another, and that with connection, however that's going to be, uh, you know, a smile, a laugh, a hey, I love Dave Matthews, whatever. That <laughs> that starts you know that starts the fire. I agree, and. I, I have an example of this where, and I've told this story on, on another episode as well, but in, in our football team, we're gathering players from all the way across Canada, from Sydney, Nova Scotia to Vancouver. And we go to this three-week tournament where everyone's thrown together in a foreign country and we're supposed to operate like this national team. And we're supposed to operate like a team, even though the opportunities to be a team in between the tournaments uh, are basically nil. And so we had a lock-in meeting where we were able to, uh, where we handed out the jerseys and we had this celebration, uh, welcome to the team. And then everyone had to get up and say one thing about themselves that only a handful of people knew and then explain why wearing the, the maple leaf of Canada on their chest was important to them and their family. And Obviously, there was there was um, you know it was a closed door policy. If any of the, the stories left that room, uh, you were done off the team. But uh, what happened after that was really magical because the next day on the bus, everyone was sitting with different people. They had made new connections now from hearing these going back to that that idea of vulnerability, these vulnerable ideas, and now they had new partners. They they had new brothers that kind of understood what they were going through, whether they were you know, had lost a parent or whether they both had anxiety um, or whether they had both, uh, you know, whatever it was, attempted suicide. Like you, you can get really, you know, um, dark things come out, but now you've got an, a new brother and, um, you know, we, we actually didn't achieve what we wanted to on the field, but the group came away really tight because they had learnt a lot about themselves from the, that connection moment. Um, so I think it was a success for us because we were able to uncover that, uh, you know, wins and losses didn't matter after, after that session. Wow. So I would agree. I think the connection comes first. You think it comes first. Interesting. Okay. That's been my experience at least. And, and, you know, I'm sure there's examples that are maybe the other way around. 
that that you know the the teamwork and the winning especially brings you together before there's a connection uh, and maybe something that that we haven't talked about is even respect um you know you can respect people without being connected to them and probably churn out something pretty magical yeah what that says though is that in the hiring process to go back to what you talked about Claude earlier and how you hire is that if that connection, if that's our hypothesis, that the connection needs to come first, that there needs to be something in the hiring and in the onboarding process that allows people to feel connected to the group. Um, and like you said, it might be a smile. It can be something very simple, but there needs to be something that allows people to feel like they are part or they, they belong from day one. So that's interesting to mm-hmm. think about. Yeah. And, and that's something that really needs to be fixed, I think. Um where, you know, I'm generalizing here, but for the most part, what we do is we, we spend all this time interviewing and, and everything. And then as soon as that person arrives on, on Monday morning at nine o'clock, we're like, well, here's your laptop and, uh, you know, and, uh, I'll see you, uh, at lunch. And, you know, the, we don't really put any attention into that. I think that's, that could be a real source of competitive advantage for someone that, really sort out how to continue, uh, you know, that connection piece from the interview process to the onboarding process. Mm-hmm. We have, um, so we have a four day orientation process here. And, uh, this isn't by the way to paint us in with, you know, rosy colored glasses or be Pollyanna. There's tons of stuff to, to fix and revise and everything, but, um, no matter who you are, you could be a C-suite, you could be a junior art director, if you are starting that same week, you're in the same onboarding class. And that's a four day class. It starts at 9.30 every day, it ends at 2.30. And then you go and you sit with your teams or whomever, wherever you belong. In that onboarding, you're going to uh, not only get a laptop, obviously, you're gonna meet with someone from each and every discipline and they're gonna run you through what they do. So that's the secret sauce. When people wonder, you know, well, what does Vayner do? It really starts on that first day. Uh, or those first four days. You're also, you're paired up with different buddies every day for lunch. So not only are you getting to know people, you're getting to know the, the area in which you work. If you don't know, you know, where to eat lunch or where to get a coffee. And those those things I think all contribute to to the culture without a doubt. Now we had this, this week, for example, we had a breakdown there and it's, it was so interesting because there's such a high expectation that our orientation process knocks it out of the park. And it didn't this week. And wouldn't you know, I really, really heard about it from people in orientation, from leadership, from people that, uh, the peop- that were waiting for their, uh, their new team members. So it's, um, it's something that really works for us when it works. And, uh, and, I, and we can rely on it. All right. So you start with the point of connection by having people in a cohort that cuts across um, hierarchy and then have them rotate or have conversations with different people depending on the discipline and then different buddies during lunch. And are they, could it like a really senior person, for example, that's coming in C-suite end up having lunch with a person who's fairly junior? Would you do that, do that kind of pairing? Absolutely. 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 Yeah. So your first lunch, so Whitney, if you come in, you're in the C-suite, your first lunch will probably be with someone on your team. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's going to be, you know, um, a copywriter, or maybe it's going to be an art director. Um, and then you'll go through different people that you will be connected with in the, you know, in the coming months and, and years, hopefully. But yeah, there's, we try to really make it as flat as possible. And I was, I was speaking to, um, Andrea Sullivan yesterday about our, uh, she's our chief uh, client officer. And I was speaking to her about our orientation process. And she started a year ago and she said, I am still great friends with every, everyone in that class. And I was thinking, you know, that's just awesome. Here you are, you've been around the block many times and you're telling me what still, what a great orientation process you went through. I love that. And there's, there's really not enough of that. I don't think, um, like you said, we, we tend to hang out with our, uh, our level. And so it becomes this kind of, uh, duty to, you know, go out onto the floor, um, you know, come down from the C-suite, come down from the ivory tower where it, it really shouldn't be like that at all. Um, 
you know, it, it shouldn't be an obligation. It should kind of be built into all of the processes that we have, um, like we said, right from that recruitment. Changing topics a little bit. I want to, this is a little bit down your uh, S-curve, Whitney. How do we get leaders to move from this idea of, uh, I heard it described as uh, monologue to dialogue the other day, and it was from a soccer coach I heard say this, where kind of the idea that the leader has to have all the answers and tell the team. How do we move that to a, a dialogue where we're solving problems together and there's an engaged conversation around what we're trying to achieve, whether that's a project, whether that's whatever it may be, uh, you know, realigning the corporate culture. It doesn't matter what it is, but how do we move it from that idea of the leader knows everything and needs to tell everyone to finding those those unique skills like you talked about, Claude, of everyone on the team and turning it more into a dialogue? Yeah, so I think what you're really getting out there is that we're moving. So, yes, as a leader, you need to lead people up the learning curve. But really what you're saying is you're facilitating their move up the learning curve. I think in a knowledge economy, to expect that you as a leader know everything is pure hubris and it's completely impractical. And so um, this goes back to where we started the conversation of, of Claude saying, you know, the world of HR becomes coaches is that it is your job as a leader to get the people, the resources that they need to be successful on the job. That may be that you can help them with that. 